Who the hell decided to let a human walk around the ship with a sidearm? Said one of the marines to the left of the woman who had spoken initially. Holy fucking shit, he's taller than any male I've ever met. Said the woman who had spoken initially. Ladies, I'm sorry to cut this short, but I've got to get back to the pod. Interrupted Adam, trying to defuse the situation and squeeze by at the same time. We need to have an armor-clad arm block his escape through the doorway. I don't think that's going to happen, cutie, said the marine in the lead menacingly before continuing. I think we're going to have to interrogate you and make sure you're not a threat to the ship and its crew. Earth isn't yet pacified, you know. Come on, Cadrilla, just let him leave. He's obviously allowed to be here, said the third marine, earning a withering glare from the first. Adam stepped back from his blocked exit, letting out a deep sigh. If he had to pick a place to fight three on one, it would be either a bathroom or a laundry room. There was a lot of bones in the human and sure hand that you have to be careful not to break in a fight, and the surrounding area had lots of hard surfaces for throwing people into. He mentally planned out his upcoming fight, knowing damn well he would lose to the three seven foot tall Amazons, but not intending to go down without making them suffer first. He planned on striking the first one fast, catching her off guard. He reasoned he would try to disable her throat before delivering a couple of strikes to her lower ribs before moving on to the second. For her, he planned on throwing his weight fully into the marine, attempting to throw it into her friend. For the third he would. Then his train of thought was interrupted by a familiar voice from behind the women. Can you explain exactly why you bitches are harassing the newest member of my goddamn team? Shouted Popper from the hallway. She stood at an imposing seven foot three, with her arms crossed over the chest of her suit, emblazoned with tattoo and sigil looking artwork that probably held some significance in Chilvanti culture. The Marines turned to face her, and Adam took the opportunity for what it was, short of checking the Lee Marine on the way out. Hey, what the fuck? shouted the Lee Marine incredulously. He just insulted a member of the Chilvanti military. You're just gonna let him get away with that? Yes, I fucking am, dick for brains. Papa snarled back with fire in her eyes. You're lucky that I don't have you all court martial for harassing a member of the Empress's Death Head Commander's Corps. Or better yet, I could just hold you down while my subordinate here beats you blue. Adam decided to play along with her little stunt and cracked his knuckles while staring daggers at the Marine, who seemed to be reconsidering her stance on Adam. Apologies, recruit, she said malevolently. She turned to her compatriots, who were currently looking for her, to Popper, to Adam, and back again. Come on, ladies, we're leaving. Watching as the Marine sauntered down the hall, Adam turned to Popper. Thanks, boss. He let out a breath he hadn't realised he had been holding. I really don't think it would have come out on top of that. He thanked the large woman. Don't mention it. Most of these girls have a good heart, but six months pent up on a starship above a sex plant really does a number on their cunts, she said, now calling off and slowly returning to her jovial self. I'm just annoyed because I expect more professionalism. They're fucking marines and they need to act like it, not like dick stop teens on date night. Valid assessment. I'm heading back to the bay, Adam said, turning towards the safety of his new home. All right, called Papa from behind him. Just tell her if you need a legionnaire in Brazen Armour to rescue you again. Adam chuckled to himself as he walked back to the bay with his boots in his hand. He was barefoot right now, but the shore kept the ship warm enough for the smooth metal deck to avoid being cold against his feet. As he walked back into the room, Ferry was in the process of slipping a tank top similar to his over her ample bust, treating him to another lovely view. He turned his eyes away from the site and grabbed his rug from where it lay against Cutter's old bunk, taking it over to his new sleeping quarters. Slip was still laying in her bunk, tapping away on her on the pad. He set the rucksack down next to the footlocker that sat at the end of his bed, reaching inside one of the front pockets and pulling forth a bundled pair of green socks. Carrying extra socks his rucksack had been a lesson learned early on in his military career, one that had only solidified in his time in the militia. Sitting down to put on his socks, he looked at the now-dressed Varela, who was ogling him in his admittedly revealing tank top. What? he asked, finishing his socks and moving to the boots. It felt weird to wear boots and what were essentially basketball shorts, but... Making do with what you have on hand was something he was used to. You're going to make quite the splash with the girls in the chow hall dressed like that, she said, gesturing to Adam vaguely. Well, there's not much I can do about that, unfortunately. I don't have any other clothes at the moment, and you ladies like it hot and humid, he replied with a shrug, lacing his upper boot. I'm sure she fucking would, Marta slipped under her breath from the bunk next to his, earning a glare from Ferry. Anyway, continued Ferry, let's head down and get you some chow, big man. She finished off with a winning smile, gesturing for Adam to fall in behind her. Fuck it, says Slip. I'm hungry too. She rose to her feet and followed behind Adam and Ferry. As they navigated the winding hallways, the three soldiers chatted about their backgrounds. Ferry had come from somewhat of a periphery world called Nifil, and was considered a bit of a bumpkin by Shulbanti standards. Due to the endless jokes from Slip on their walk, he learned that the world didn't have a spaceport, 
which was apparently a marker for what made a proper civilised world. She also apparently had a sincere love of video games, something she and Slip apparently shared, given that they launched on a tangent about the newest Turok's Order game, and its apparent femme or masculine fatal protagonist as it were. To Adam it sounded vaguely like a combination of Tomb Raider and Call of Duty, but when he voiced his opinion, both women started attempting to cajole and entice Adam into playing the apparently two-player game with them in the rec room. Laughing at them both, clearly jockeying for his attention, he said he would have to see, as he didn't yet know what his schedule looked like. Both women were clearly nonplussed at his avoidance of their offers, but continued discussing the merits of the two main factions in the game without further input from Adam. When they walked into the chow hall, Adam felt like he was in one of those old western movies where the hero walks into a saloon, only for the music to die away and silence to fall on the patrons as they stared and sighted up the main character. Almost every eye was now fixated on the trio as they moved towards the serving line. The gazes in question indicated everything from lust to confusion, jealousy and hatred directed at Adam and his compatriots. Clearly the room ran the gauntlet of fresh boots to grizzled veterans who had lost friends to earthborn fighters. Hell, maybe some of them had lost friends to men associated with his former unit. Once they made it to the line, conversation picked back up, and Adam asked his teammates, So, uh, that was weird, right? What, the staring or the uncomfortable silence? replied Slip. Both, I guess. Huh? Furry started, making a so-so gesture with her hand. Consider it from their perspective. The armed, gorgeous man from the sex world walks into the chow hall with two death set commandos. It sounds like the start of a bad joke, she said giggling. I really wish you stopped calling it a sex world. You guys just have unusual expectations of men, he said, mildly annoyed. It was Slip's turn to giggle now. You've never met a Shovati male, have you? She asked with a smile. Can't say I've had the pleasure, no. What, are they ice creams or something? I don't know what that means, but if you're asking if they tend to be a bit standoffish, then yes. That's putting it mildly. Slip said. Well, that clears up some of the attitudes I saw from Marines and Green's own bars, he replied, eliciting a nod from the woman. They moved through the chow line, each receiving a large meat patty that looked vaguely like a hamburger, and smelled vaguely of garlic and honey. They also received a conglomeration of vaguely lettuce-looking plants, a bottle full of green liquid, and a massive, by comparison, loaf that smelled like pound cake. As they looked for an open table, they saw Popper waving them over from a table in the corner of the room. They meandered over. Adam hearing harsh whispers as they passed by occupied tables. Betty's fucking all of them too, fucking lucky bitches. Wish I had a hot piece of ass like that in our platoon. I heard he single-handedly killed 150 rebel soldiers and personally presented their scouts to the pod leader. He'll wash out a selection in a fucking week, I fucking know it. Shaking off the comments as he sat down at Popper's table, the group ate in companionable silence for a bit before Ferry and Popper started arguing over some Shobanti sports team that Adam really didn't care about. Finishing his meal along with Ferry and Slip, they got up and headed for the door. Popper having talked so much she barely touched her loaf of what Adam had properly identified as some form of alien pound cake that tasted vaguely of mango. When they made it back to the squad bay, Slip split off from the trio, citing that she wanted to get in a workout before bed. Adam and Ferry went inside, and as he was taking off his boots, the silence was broken when Ferry asked, Can we have that talk now? I guess now is as good a time as any, he said trying to pull his compartmentalised feelings to the surface and organise them into a manageable lump. Do you want to start or shall I? I can start, I guess, she said, looking slightly dejected. Adam assumed this was because she was expecting rejection. Listen, I'm not the best with this whole relationship deal. I've only ever dated one guy back in school and he broke it off when he heard I was joining the Marines. I've spent the past four years looking for a guy who understood the kind of life I live, both in the Marines and here. She took a deep breath and continued. And then, on my first rotation with a commando pod, I bungle a knob, get two of my teammates killed, and right at the moment I think I'm about to die, staring my death in the face, a handsome alien walks into my life, saves me, and nurses me back to health. Goddess, what would my mother think, letting a male rescue me? She looked up from where she was staring a hole in the floor with a sad smile on her face before continuing. And then he has the audacity to not only understand the lifestyle, but be one of the most competent fighters I've ever met. It's like I'm living in a recruit's wet dream, but I still feel like I'm just waiting for the other hammer to fall. When she finished, she gave him a hopeful but conflicted smile, clearly trying to control her hopes and desires, and bring them down from the highest they had soared in her head. I'll be honest with you, Fairy, Adam said, rising to his feet and looking her in the eye. The last few days have been a wild ride for me. I'm still processing my emotions regarding the whole situation. I'm happy to be here, but the culture shock is still wearing off. I'm not used to the idea of Command being okay with relationships between squad, uh, podmates. At this, Ferry's eyes sunk to the floor once again, her shoulders slumping. It's okay. I understand how rough this must be for... 
She stopped when she was interrupted by Adam stepping closer, cupping her jaw softly with one hand and pulling her in for a gentle kiss. Her eyes fluttered briefly as the shot from Adam seeing her kiss from her settled in, sending her face through a roller coaster of emotions, finally setting on bliss. Breaking the kiss, Adam continued from where he had left off. But I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel the same, so hear me out. We're going to take this slow. Whatever happens, happens. As I understand it, we'll have a couple of weeks on Fayara, plus a few more days on the ship for us to figure out what this is between us. Fairy, for her part, looked like she was between crying tears of joy and vibrating out of her skin at Adam's acceptance and requital of her feelings. But then I have to go off to selection for a couple- <laughs> Fairy didn't let him finish his sentence, instead jerking him into a deep and much more aggressive kiss than the one he had planted on her. He decided that he was fine with this and melted into her embrace. Fucking get some, Fairy! came a recognisable voice from the front of the room. Fairy and Adam quickly broke apart in the presence of Popper, now smirking at them. Adam, by force of habit, fell into parade rest at the presence of the team's senior NCO, while Fairy shuffled and looked to the ground like a teenager who had been caught up past their bedtime. I apologise, Sergeant, I didn't hear you come in, said Adam, straightening out. It's a riot, and drop the formal shit. We don't do that around here, she continued with a sigh. Listen, I don't have to remind you of the official stance of our military and relationships, but as this team's senior non-commissioned officer, I have one request. Please don't do anything more than what you were just doing in the pop, eh? I really don't want to walk in on anything. Understood. Both Adam and Ferry reply simultaneously. They continued to talk quietly at the ends of their respective bunks for several minutes, before Slip and Classy walked into the room. Hey, said Popper to the two newcomers. You would never guess who I caught sucking face a few minutes ago. The ever-silent Classy just shook her head and wandered over to her bunk, stripping out of her armour and into her small clothes before crawling into bed. Slip, on the other hand, turned to Popper with a raised eyebrow. I'm pretty sure I know who, but enlighten me, Gossip Empress, she said, casting a passing glance at the juror in question. Popper just laughed, clearly catching the glance and said, Heh, got it in one. Figures, they've been making bedroom eyes at each other any time they think they can get away with it, since we picked their asses up on the mountain, Slip said before continuing. Whatever, doesn't matter to me. I'm gonna hit the sack. Popper got up and flicked the light panel by the door, dropping the room into darkness. Shortly after, Adam heard the soft impacts of both giants collapsing in their bunks. Frey pulled Adam in for one last kiss before retiring to her bunk. Adam collapsed on his own a few seconds later, and clearly he was more tired than he expected, having not slept properly in almost 48 hours. Sleep took him moments after his head hit the pillow, the events of the last few days growing ever distant in his mind as he fell away.